Well, welcome back, everyone. This is our our last one for grade four. Space is new for grade four, but also this is our last session um, from the second round of doing our sessions for the science. So welcome aboard, and hopefully you're going to find today um, helpful and that we've got enough resources to at least get you started in your planning and in, in whatever direction you want to take it. My name is Chris Sarsky. I'm one of the consultants with ARPDC, working mostly in the Clark area, Central Alberta. And I have the best science partner in the world to plan with, and I'll let Ted introduce himself. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ted Zeroni. I'm with the Edmonton Regional Learning Consortia. Uh, so it's a, the capital region here in Central Alberta, North, North Central Alberta, I guess. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. I know it's a busy time and Perhaps some of you have convention time coming up as well, which is kind of nice. So welcome. I'm glad you were able to join us this afternoon. You bet. So we are unpacking, as we said, space for you. And uh, as we have with all of our other um, slide decks that we've shared with you, uh, on the land acknowledgement page, we've always tried to link something that relates to what you've been doing or going to do or unpack and plan for. And so uh, in this particular case, just sort of shared with you a little bit of a, a blurb in, in the sense of what Indigenous perspectives are with regards to sky science. Um, and that it's extremely important to them. It's as important to them as Mother Earth is. So um, there's lots of connections. There won't be a shortage of resources that we're going to share with you for connections on star science and the Indigenous perspective. But also just to start you off, we have sort of the, the moon and the indigenous sky lore that goes along with that, which is part of, and also fills into grade five as well. For any of you who are doing grade five science, it would it would fit very well into that area as well. And we'll unpack a little bit more of that as our time goes on together today. So in the spirit of reconciliation, we want to acknowledge that this gathering is taking place on traditional lands across the province of Alberta, home to many diverse First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. We acknowledge that this land is a traditional meeting ground, giving voice to its original peoples and the story of creation of this country in a way that history has forgotten. So you will see some similarities and um, tried to change it up a little bit for you, so you're not seeing exactly the same thing, but some similarities between what we talked about and other ones, just to sort of catch everybody up and not everybody has been with us for every session. So we just want to beg your indulgence that if you heard something before, just hang in there for somebody who might not have heard that. Um, but again, going through some surface level activities in hopes that we will be able to just get you started in your planning and give you some thoughts about how you might unpack this particular unit. Um, and then maybe some places where it might transfer into to grade five as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Ted, who's going to start us off, and away we go. All right. Thanks, Chris. Um, you have in front of you a, a chart uh, or a table with some icons there, and I just maybe want to clarify what those icons are. Those of you who've traveled in rural Alberta will have seen these in the farmyards, but they really are grain silos. Uh, farmers uh, open a hatch at the top, and they pour the grain into the top, and then when they want to pull some grain out, they open a hatch at the bottom where it sort of narrows down and, and do that. And we're using the representation of silos, I think, to, to understand where we're moving from in terms of the old curriculum and the new curriculum. Um, we know that those of you taught grade four science last year, perhaps um, understand that uh, the, the, the curriculum itself or the program of studies was broken down into various topics. So in grade four, we had uh, building devices and vehicles, light and shadows, plant and growth changes, waste, which is a similar uh, idea to what we have this year in science, and wheels and levers. And we were able to move from one silo to the next or one unit to the next without really going back and linking into what we previously learned, previously learned in other organizing ideas or what we previously learned from other grades. So that's when we use that um, metaphor of the silo. They were separate units of study that stood there separately and we moved on from one to the X to the next. But as we know, when we look at the new curriculum now, the idea of topics change and we replace the idea with something called um, organizing ideas. And now those organizing ideas are something that move in and out of each um, grade. Matter is something that is taken from grades K to six, 
as are all of them except for scientific message methods, which isn't um, done in kindergarten, um, nor is living systems uh, in kindergarten. And space begins at grade four uh, and moves to grade six. But again, that continuity of ideas, you'll see even though we're, space is not uh, taught in grades three and four, some ideas from the other grade living systems do enter space, especially some of the skills and some of the other uh, concepts. So the question becomes of what makes those organizing ideas allow for that flow or that free flow and exchange of ideas and information where we have to look back and look sideways at things we've learned in previous years or other organizing ideas. And it's the knowledge and the skills and the understandings that make that happen. It's those three columns in, in the organizing idea uh, and what's developed in those three columns that sometimes are standalones, but quite often they, they're, they're referred to in other organizing ideas and other grades as well. So what we're going to do today is take a look at, uh, at specifically those things in, in terms of how they relate to space in grade four. Um, and it's important, though, when we think about space in grade four and all the, the knowledge and uh, understandings associated with it, it's tempting to go really, really deep into this and learn everything about all the planets and everything like that. But I think I just want to bring you back to the to the to the learner outcome and, and the guiding question. And the guiding question, we're really looking at how do the objects in space impact daily life? Uh, the outcome is that students are going to investigate and describe objects in space to connection in daily life. So we're not really getting into why things are happening in our space, how they're composed, the whole thing of, 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 of uh, the solar system and how things are connected in the solar system. That happens in grade six. And in grade five, we take a look at more of an explanation as to why some of these phenomena happen. In grade four, then we're just taking a look at what do we see in the sky and how does that impact us now and, and, and in previous cultures as well. So the way we do that is by then taking a look at, uh, again, what do students need to know? What do they need to be able to do? When do they need, need to be able to understand this organizing idea? And just as a quick review in terms of what the students know, again, we're going to look at that, that concept knowledge. What are some of those concepts that are important? And they're quite specific. Uh, we get to talk about star and constellation. They're quite specific to the space unit. But we also know the word prediction comes into play, for example, and that's something that is a, what is a prediction and how do you do it is something that transcends many organizing ideas. There are some facts that are just stuck right in here in science that don't move anywhere, but they're things that people need to, the students need to know in terms of facts. And of course, there's that skill of procedure knowledge. In other words, how do you do an investigation? How do you compare and contrast? How do you sort? Those are all the knowledge pieces. So specifically for grade four um, space, um, what we're looking at here are these things. Uh, you'll, you'll have access to the, all these concept maps, but really be, we're taking a look at space, um, uh, or excuse me, the universe is, if we start at the very top, uh, the universe is, 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 includes all of space and everything in it, including all the objects in it. And the objects include things like stars or the groups of stars, such as our constellations, where we go to the left. Um, we, the objects also include, they should have a line to planets uh, and their moons. And we know that Earth is a planet and our moon is one of the moons. Uh, and some of the stars and constellations are, are looked at as well. So we take a look at the stars and the constellations uh, mostly here in this grade. We also take a look at some tools and now we can view these objects. And then, of course, you'll see I've highlighted those four concepts uh, for that, uh, especially the idea of that objects and space have an impact on our daily activities. So we have to, have to understand what those objects are and what their impacts are in terms of how we live. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of the skills and procedures, I'm not going to highlight all the separate ones in this particular organizing idea because you'll be able to, you know, they're, they're quite visible there. I think what I would like to do at this point, though, is just highlight those grade four skills and procedure verbs that, that you'll see show up in all of grade four and its entirety of grade four. Um, I have two lists there and they're in the green. Uh, the first column in the green is just by alphabetical order. You can see all the verbs uh, identified there. And the second column is in the green is by the frequency. You'll inter interesting to note that in this, in grade four, 
the, the verbs that show up most constant are discuss, relate, comparing, and then collaborating, demonstrating, describing, for example. Um, so those are ones that you'll want students to practice all the time. There are other ones that show up, and that is, for example, um, um, I think I missed, I've got a wrong slide here. You probably have to refresh this at another point, but the yellow ones here are all those related to that idea of investigating. And we'll talk, I'll show you a slide later on that talks about what does it mean to investigate in grade four, but all those yellow ones there relate to that. Um, so when you're doing some thinking there, that's what we'll see show up uh, are those things. Oh, sorry, did you refresh? <laughs> yeah, I'll refresh just to just. Oh in case. boy, maybe I just didn't throw the slide in. Uh, I I thought I had. Um, never mind. We'll be good. Well, I think maybe it shows up on the next slide. That's why, Chris, I just didn't delete this one. So if you can go to the next slide. Yeah, I'll just bring this up here. There we Sorry go. Sorry about that. I just didn't do oh, it. Okay. Just wanted to make sure that we weren't behind the, <laughs> the ball here. Uh, yeah. There we, go. there we go. So all the yellow ones relate to that whole notion of investigation. And so what it might look like, for example, um, deciding and exploring or concluding only show up once. Whenever you do an investigation with students, they're going to be doing these things. They're going to be concluding. They're going to be recording observations. They'll likely do some tests. They'll be collecting data, analyzing, planning their investigations, and so on. So they're all related in a way. In a sense, they become a, a very important group of verbs to work with in grade four science. I've added some pink ones in there and I shouldn't have, shouldn't have done that, but under the grade four one, those are all related to something called design thinking. That's that whole creativity thing that comes into play in computer science, but is quite visible in the skills and procedures as you can see the pink verbs. So here we're collaborating to be creative, deciding on a project, evaluating whether it's good or not, making changes and so on. And you can see, for example, as well, I've highlighted uh, some skills and procedures from grades K to three to show that those that were taught in grade uh, K to three and expected to be practiced continue into grade four to six. So for the most part, by the time you get them to grade four, after they've had a chance to go through the K to three grades, they should be familiar and be uh, more adept at these at these skills. Sorry, we'll move on. <laughs> yeah, great, it's all good. Um, so very quickly then, if you want to know what the grade, what the skills and procedures state or um, um, steps are, you need to go to that grade two curriculum. So if we go to the next slide, Chris. I'll show how that 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 progresses along the way. What this slide shows are the different ideas, not all of them, but some of the main things covered in in scientific methods from grades one to grade six. And you could see at the bottom left hand corner, grade two identifies those steps or procedures for an investigation. When we get to grade three to six, there are no new steps introduced. Rather, each grade starts developing a little bit more and deeper understanding about those steps. So for example, uh, there's a focus on data and evidence and the international system of units, but that does not mean that students are still not doing all those things that were introduced in grade two. We're just taking that step four, observer, observing and recording data and getting a little bit deeper to it and talking about descriptive data and uh, quantitative data and so on and how data contributes to create our evidence that it essentially is our conclusions that we make uh, and our explanations along the way. So keep in mind that the grade two steps are still really important for grade four when we're talking about an investigation. We can move to the next slide. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about computer science at this point because there are also skills, as I showed from the previous slide, the very first slide of skills and procedures, that there are some things in computer science that can be integrated in for that kids can practice those skills and use them to demonstrate what they know and understand. We know that in kindergarten and kindergarten to grades two, there's a lot of following and creating instructions. That's the emphasis. We know that one of the steps in computer science or investigations in science is to plan out your investigation. In other words, what are the steps? What do we have to do? So you can see how the skills from computer science tie right into science. There's also an introduction of divergent thinking and creative thinking skills. How do we think, uh, make things original? And there's a link there to introduce you to a couple things. One is just brainstorming, which we're familiar with. 
and the scamper technique. We don't have to go to that now, Chris, but it's something that's there for you to look at if you do want. Um, yeah, it just that uh, we're probably things are probably all familiar, but sometimes we forget to include these in our in our lessons and our plans because they just we we just overlook them. And if we can drop, put them in our um, um, old toolbox where we re revisit them more, there's more opportunities and op for students to practice those divergent thinking skills. And when we get to grade three, we're also introduced to computational thinking and design thinking. Um, computational thinking are those sub skills. Yeah, we can go to the next slide, Chris, because this is introduced in grade three. Um, uh, that whole thing of that whole process of computational thinking, uh, breaking things into smaller chunks, uh, finding patterns, identifying the important details, then designing your instructions from that. And you have your instructions. And you, does this all work together? If not, then let's go back and, and fix it up. Um, uh, we we have a CPAR document, our curriculum planning assessment resource. Uh, we could open that, Chris, if you want to take a we I don't know, should we take a look at it now? Let's take a quick peek. Um, yeah, we and we're not going to go through it in, in detail because we're, it's a, it's a quite a long document. <laughs> Chris, do you want to highlight any of the things at this point or we'll go through it fairly quickly or? So really the opening pieces, if you've seen the CPAR documents from the mainstream science, just the organizing ideas, you will see that a lot of this is aligned in the same way. So Anne just tried to keep it look the same so that you're not really finding too many differences. However, she's tailored this specifically to the computing science. And remember she had all the way through our series always created a slide deck specific to each grade, specific to each organizing idea. So she's really fleshed this out for you. And you can kind of see, again, it's a work in progress. We're gonna to continue to, to move forward and we're gonna to continue to add to these as well. But she's using the same layout that we have with the prerequisite knowledge. You have misconceptions, I know I can statements, I understand statements, the essential vocabulary, but all specific to the computing science. And then she has broken down again, your knowledge, understanding skills and procedures, and then looked at what are some surface level activities related to computing science versus some of the deeper ones. So it mirrors the, the way that the other ones were laid out um, and you see them in there. She's also done a great job of including some resources at the bottom for you and ideas within. So this will be a super fantastic resource for you to, to add into. And we will link these into the other CPAR documents as well so that they're kind of a one-stop shop in there. But she's done a fantastic job on these. Anything else you want to add to that, Ted? No, thanks, Chris. I, I just wanted to highlight those that, that sometimes we, we think of the computer science component, even at grade four, as just something that the kids are working on in computers. When we'll show, I'll show you an example later on this computational thinking is something that can happen uh, at all uh, across the different organizing ideas, not just when we're working on a computer. Same with the next set of skills that's introduced in grade four um, computer science, and that's design thinking. And design thinking is essentially a problem solving technique uh, that at the end of the day is to produce something for a user. So what is the problem that we're trying to do? What are a whole bunch of ideas? So you can see where that divergent thinking comes in. Okay, how do we plan to do this thing? How are we going to make it? And then you see there's that creation part. Well, let's put it together. And you sit back and say, does it work? You can either, and that makes, so you go through everything to make sure you think you got everything in place. And then you give it a test. If it doesn't work, you, you troubleshoot. And that could be with anything, whether it's creating a little instrument or if it's creating some code on computer science. Or maybe, as you'll see, the example that we're using is um, that I'll show later is just when we're making a representation. We can always go through the same process where you, what's my representation going to look like? We gather a whole bunch of ideas. We're going to plan what it might look like. We create it. We analyze it maybe based on criteria that we're given ahead. Does it have everything here? Give it to a friend to look at, to get some pre-assessment, some peer editing, give it a test. No, and then uh, do some troubleshooting. So that design thinking skills can happen, again, not only with computers and computer science, but in a lot of things that kids do throughout uh, all the organizing ideas and in fact, other, other uh, courses or other subjects. 
For sure. So again, so there's that grade four C par at the top there. That link is there. That'll give some things as well. So we've got lots of skills that we can use at the end of the day. Yeah, we're good, Chris. Yeah, we can move forward. So the, the, there's skills mentioned in the skills and procedure statement. We know that in the computer science and scientific methods, there's lots of skills that we can use as well. And we use those skills to for kids to develop their understandings, to deepen their understandings, and to demonstrate their understandings. Um, the understandings themselves are, as we remember, they're just how we put together all those knowledge pieces. So we know in grade four science, some of the concepts are stars and constellation. Students are introduced the idea of navigation and, and they've taken a look at time several times. But how are all these things put together? What, what meaning do they have when we put them together? And there are a couple of examples there to say how, there's a couple of ways we could put together those uh, those um, concepts in some meaningful way. We can travel to the stars uh, and other constellations that we would require careful navigation and take much time. It's very different than the next understanding, but using the same concepts. Stars and constellations assist with navigation and tracking time. So those the understandings in our, in our curriculum, again, are just those pieces of knowledge put together in a meaningful and logical way, which is bigger and really our, our big target when we're trying to um, move forward through the curriculum and assess students. So we can go to the next slide, Chris. And, and you'll see the understandings in this organizing idea. And you'll see what I mentioned at the start that we're not really diving into what are the planets and how everything is connected and how, what the compositions are and so on. We're just looking at observing planets, which is the first one, um, where they look like, and it just sort of gives that sense of place in the universe. Then we zoom in on stars and constellations and how they help with navigation and passage of time. And then more of a, of a historical look at how observations of objects in time and space um, connect to da daily life as well. So that's the focus of these. Those are the key three key understandings. And um, in order to do that, then we're going to plan ahead. How are we going to get through all these understandings, where's a good place to start? And if we go to the next slide, Chris, the good place to start is always beginning, I think this is the next slide, uh, yeah. beginning with the end in mind. In other words, how are, what are some of our big assessment pieces are we gonna have in place so that um, we can make sure we have our, our understandings met, for example, or our learner outcome? Here's one uh, sample assessment, for example, and you can see how it brings together many things that might have been covered in the understanding, in the development of the understandings and the individual knowledge pieces. So the example here is to choose three objects in space, then rank order them by the significance of their impact on daily life. And then choose a way to represent your ranking and justify your ranking. So there's a lot going on there. The students do need to know a lot and be able to do a lot. And I've listed some of those things there. But some of those things that maybe they've learned already from previous organizing ideas or previous grades. So they may not, so you'll have to do some pre-assessment along the way to figure that out. And that's why we present to you a lot of the, the lessons and sample activities in here through the uh, surface deep uh, transfer um, process, which is the next slide. And you want to do some pre-assessment to know what are those skills that students know how to do. They, if this is this is calling for rank ordering and it's calling for rank ordering typically involves some kind of evaluative kind of piece. Uh, do students know how to do that? Do they know how to make good representations? What are criteria of representations? Have they had practice making representations before we have them make one in an assessment to demonstrate what they know? Do they know what the objects in the in the um in the um in, in space are, in the sky, or do they know what constellations are and the various types of constellations? And so those are the things you would pre-assess. And then if they don't know those things, we work at them at the surface level. And then we put together those understandings, right? That's where we put linked together uh, stars, constellation, and navigation, for example. What's the link there between there? How do they help uh, have the help human with daily activities or with human activities? And then we get to the transfer piece, which is essentially a new context or something unfamiliar, a task they've never done before. And that's where we get the transfer piece happening. So Chris is going to then take you through a, a lot of uh, uh, surface deep and surface deep and, and we'll get to some transfer activities at the end. Uh, and that's all we're going to be packing this for the rest of the session.
And so I, you know, with the three different understandings we have, I think you're going to find that very often, especially in 1.2, 1.3, they're going to flow and mix together because they really do tie together. They're not really discrete in that sense. Um, and I think we would do the kids a disservice if we presented it that way. I think they need to see how they are connected through time and current. I, th I think those are really important. But again, I, I think we need to start off with what do they really know and, and what kind of language are your kids familiar with maybe and what kind of things do they, are they, have they heard? They may not know the meanings of them. So just maybe having them work just on, these are just ideas, but just having them start off with um, what are some advantages of going out in space? Like, why do we even care about going out there? They may have never thought about the question, but just making a list of some possible advantages and disadvantages and maybe putting them on the board and having a conversation about that so they get a sense. Some ideas that we've come up with um, are listed here, not suggesting that they're exhaustive in any stretch of the imagination. But again, hopefully they would be some things that the kids would, the students would bring forward and, and would certainly talk about um, in relation to the things that they've heard, even just in the news for other things that are related to cost and expense or danger and risk or you know, we maybe we're running out of space on Earth. Maybe that's what they think. And we need to go on outer space to do that. Right. Or now you can buy a ticket and and go and fly to the moon and come back again. So all of those things are all different pieces. Um, at the beginning of the session, we were playing the Star Trek, um, just a, an ode to Star Trek for a bit. But again, you know, it kind of shows that the, the spaceship warps out of, and we're not there yet. But what if we were? Like, how would that look? You know, so it's just to see what do they know and maybe get a sense of where you would be starting from from them with them. So we might even just ask them, what's up there? Like that's kind of your start of, of your first understanding is what do they know about what they see up in the sky? Um, you know, do they know stars? Do they know a planet when they see a star? Do they know that's a planet? Do they know what do they know about the moon? What do they know about the sun? What do they know about anything else that's up there, right? So just what objects are in space and what can you name from them? And then talking to them about what does the universe mean? What does that mean to them? And do they have a, a sense that that is that big umbrella that we're opening up and saying it encompasses everything, right? And we're not going to learn everything. We're not going to unpack every rung of the umbrella in grade four. We're just going to kind of do that that piece of the umbrella, the, the fabric that it's been made of and get a sense of all the things that are in there. And then when they get to grade five and six, we're going to get very specific about them and maybe how some of those things impact us even more so. So really just talking about what the universe is. Cognizant too, that this is a unit where you're asking them to look up. And so for those of you that are in rural Alberta, those students are going to have seen a different, they're living on the farm, they have a different night sky than somebody who's living in the city. Um, they see a lot more, they, they have the potential of being able to look up and maybe seeing a very strong Milky Way in, in the distance. But if I have lots of light within the city, of course, that's going to change things. So those are all pieces that we'll have to take into account here, wherever you are located and whatever our expectations will be for the students. So make a list of objects that you notice in the sky with a partner. You know, if they were to go outside and close their eyes or just look right now and say, what do you, what do you remember? What do you see at the star? They might say stars. They might say moon. What else might they say? What, what have they seen along that? Have some of them ever seen a satellite tracking? So just to get a sense again, and and even talking about, uh, did you want to go into this one, Ted? Do you want to go into exploration? No, no, I don't. It's just that quite often the the word explore shows up in 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 the skills and procedures, and it's really about asking those questions. Like it, an exploration is really about asking questions and seeing what's there, and similar to Noah's the Wonder, which we'll see on the next slide. So it's just there to help help students understand what we mean by explore when we use it. Right. And the notice and wonder, you know, just because they're in grade four doesn't mean we assume that they just really know what that all means. We often just say, what do you notice? What do you wonder? But sometimes our students have only been exposed to a very small sort of box about what the notice language might have been or what would I look for when I'm noticing something? So, again, you have some links down here. We won't go into each one of these, but Ted's done a fantastic job of building slide decks in the background for you to unpack. What does it mean to notice something? 
And then even more so, I guess mine is always the wonder. A lot of kids just know, I wonder, I wonder if, I wonder if, well, is there, is it only if, is it, could it be that, could it be why, could it be how, could it be, if we don't ever expose them to all those sentence stems, maybe have them up in the classroom, then the wonder gets pretty limited because, they, and it's not because they don't have the wonder, they just haven't been exposed to the possibilities of what a wonder question might look like. And so this is a wonderful slide deck for you to go through with students to give them a sense of what it means to know some wonder outside of space. Like just teach me what it means to be noticing and wondering something. And then bring me back to the space question and then I might have a better sort of repertoire in my back pocket that I might be able to give you my wonders and my questions, right? That's, that's a, a big piece of it for sure. And I include that divergent thinking link again one more time, Chris, because again, it's one of those computer science thinking um, skills that does it. But, but we have to remember it again. We use divergent thinking even when we know some wonder, because when we wonder, we want to generate a lot of questions. We want, it, we want them to be very flexible in, in what in the questions they ask. And so, uh, you know, using that, those skills again for something even as with no some wonder together can help students get better at asking questions because that's really the foundation of, of, of science and inquiry is asking those good questions. Absolutely. So the common ones that students typically come up with is the moon, the sun, stars, planets they might know that some darker stars or darker brighter circles out there might be a planet they might know something about it that might be an interest for them again they might not be able to see a lot of it but nonetheless we're going to talk a little bit that's part of grade four is how do you see the things that are above your head like what could you use as a tool what can you do with those okay and those types of things so maybe once they've kind of come up with some of this maybe just to have them do a little bit of research into something nothing specific remember you're not unpacking the entire planetary order and their revolution around like none of that that's that's all in grade six but just a general infographic maybe you start with that and they create something of what they've learned or some of the questions even that they might have right so it it gives them an opportunity to to look at what that might be ted do you want to talk about the infographic um not any if you're not too familiar with it is it, again it's really basically a a poster, but it's basically it certainly has themes. It has really, um, it has really important graphics or telling graphics. It's got typically connections, connecting things together to help a reader when they look at it. They can read through with with the flow using using images, color, and words to um, to get a message. And so there's some links that help if you've never seen or heard of an infographic before. There's some things there to help you understand what it is. And to identify the character of it or characteristics of it of again and again you can see at the bottom I, I i connected up that design thinking right so if we're going to represent something with understand it is what we're trying to represent what are we trying to have people really understand uh and then start brainstorming some ideas and so on so even though we're using the skill of representing uh, where design thinking doesn't show up in the skills and procedures process you can see how we can take that and really deepen the tasks that students are given and give them practice and working at some of those skills that are really important when you stop and think about it in terms of critical and creative thinking that they can carry on with them. And if you've never done an infographic, there are a lot, if you Google them, there are lots of free templates that you can use, like a variety of them. So you could even give students choice for sure. Yeah. And the design and thinking will come up in one of the activities that that's out there. I'm not saying you have to do it, but it would be one that you could definitely do with students. Um, that'll give them a chance to demonstrate their ability. So what technologies, right? We asked you to look up, we asked you to tell us what you see, but obviously we know that there are certain technologies and tools that we can use in order to facilitate seeing those stars, those planets, those things that are above us. And so students need to have a good sense of what that might be. Maybe they can name a few of them. Maybe they are limited in what they know they can do, right? And so Again, that's just to have a quick discussion before we just sort of stand up and deliver and say, hey, you know, you could use a telescope or we could maybe just find out first, what do we know and what do we know about telescopes and, and how many people in the class have actually ever done a telescope or used a telescope before? You know, is it going to be possible for you to see something when you look outside and that gets to that light pollution again, depending on where they're located and where they live? 
If I live in Edmonton versus I live out in a farm, uh, I'm going to have a much better night sky where I don't have a lot of lights around me. Um, so again, how do we how do we navigate those waters for students? So there are a couple of we're always on the hunt, of course, for resources for you. And I normally put the resources at the very end of the slide deck, but I just want to highlight a couple of them. So we do have an agreement with uh, a couple of other countries that we've been able to use their resources. This is one that, uh, this is two different sets. It, this is a grade one book and resource for teachers. However, and I wouldn't say ever to, to photocopy all of them. In each of these cases, you have a student resource, a teacher's guide, as well as an ancillary guide, which is generally the activities, any photographs you need, activity links that you need. So it's kind of all done for you. It's really a matter of you kind of figuring out what would be most useful for me the way I've set up my unit. So this one is most specific to your age group and it has chapter six deals with the constellations. The rest of it fits to grade five and six. The sun and the moon and the stars is really about looking up at night. Look up and what do you see? That's really what it comes down to. So they have great visuals in the book that you could easily use on a slide deck if that's what you wanted. These are for free. So we have access to them. And again, I, like I said, I wouldn't, re I wouldn't photocopy either one of these. The student resources tend to be about 36 to 40 pages long, but the teacher's guides are anywhere from 150 to 250 pages long. They are all encompassing. They have questions, they have slides, they have um, assessments, they have suggested activities. So it's really a matter of kind of going in and having a look to see with once you've figured out how you want to unpack this, is there anything there that you could leverage that would save you a little bit of work and, and looking? So again, um, these will be, and I see I didn't hyperlink these. I don't know why I didn't, but I will before you get the slide deck today, I'll hyperlink these for you. Um, so that you have access to them. Okay, you want to talk about our other activities, Ted? Sure. Again, these are these are all surface level activities. In other words, introductory. Students may know a lot of these ideas already, um, and you'd know that by observing and seeing what they're able to do or do some pre-assessments. But if, if, if you were, if there are some concepts that you want to just double check for yourself or have students work through themselves to make sure they understand, there's a lot of activities here that are just those introductory activities. For example, um, what's a relationship? When we talk about relationships, we talk about things causing and affecting things. We know that one of the things we're looking at here is how um, you know, what effect does the, the object in space have with our daily life? So we take a look at what is that cause and effect? What That's a change perhaps in our life. And what is change? Is it a significant change or a significant effect that it has and so on? So if you're going to be looking at those kinds of things and you want to, you know, if it's the first time students maybe will be talking about cause or effect or need some clarity with those kinds of things, then these surface level activities are there to help you. Um, to do that. Um, and again, just by going through these activities, you're not going to, the students are not going to, you can't just do, do this. This is surface level. At the surface level, we introduce students to these things. But we give them practice and continual exposure to them in different contexts. So we're not just going to give them one representation to do. We'll get them to do several. If we take a look at comparing and contrasting, we're not going to do it once at the beginning of the year and then come back to it in mid-year. We're going to give them lots of practice. So that's what these are there for, those introductory things, Chris. I do want to point out the investigation steps. You don't have to do that. It's just a one way that you may want to take those steps that I um, um, showed uh, with the grade two scientific methods uh, in terms of investigation. So it talks about how to maybe introduce some um, prediction, analyzing, how to make what, what is a conclusion, and maybe how you can start making conclusions and so on. So that's all there for you to look at uh, at the surface level if you haven't already done those things or introduced those things with your students. And this um, this slide is, if I think, particularly important. And I'll just bring back a little bit of a conversation I recently had with a group of teachers who we were just finishing their units in science as well. And, and we had gone through notice and wonder and they said, well, this is great. You know, we should have had that for everything. Initially, when we first started, you know, there's a lot of info that's coming your way. We're talking about surface deep and transfer, like we're, we're giving all of this stuff to you. So I'm, I'm not sure 
that you always caught on to that these sheets were here for you. So I'm really thankful that you have the one slide that kind of takes you through those activities and this could be your go-to place because it might not have resonated with you right on the get-go that this is something I could have been using all along because Ted's absolutely right. This isn't this isn't something a child should walk away and say, oh, in that one organizing idea, we did this investigation. And in the other one, we did a representation. That should be something that they see in every organizing idea. It's not specific to one. So this is a, I hopeful, a very helpful page for you. Some of the deeper levels then, once I kind of know some of the terms and things that I might be looking for in a night sky, how do I see them? How do I refine how I might be able to, to see them more clearly and to get more detail and to learn those types of things, which kind of gets to that second piece where we talk about the tools and structures that we have. So in this case, a simple set of binoculars, sometimes students forget that that could be a, a logistical tool that I could use to see things in the night sky more clearly. Obviously going and working with a telescope to an observatory would be great. Maybe just a, a telescope that you have at home. Some students have those because that's an interest. Um, if you can find somebody who's got one and have a, a stargazing night at school, um, just having those opportunities would be great. Calgary's got a great uh, opportunity with your um, observatory that you have close by. This has the one that, that we are looking at right now is just outside of Camrose. It's one of the newer ones, again, in a dark zone park. And so therefore it's a beautiful night sky that you have access to. Um, but again, not every student is going to be able to go here or go to the um, TELUS World of Science in Edmonton or the Spark Science Center in Cal. Like not everyone's going to be able to do that, nor are you gonna be able to afford to always bus your kids there. So there have to be some other opportunities for them to see the things that they might see through a telescope. So these would be great. They still need to unpack. They still need to understand what's the, what, what does the binoculars help me see? What better than the naked eye? What does the telescope, how does it work a little bit? They don't have to know all the ins and outs of it, but what is it? And the fact that we have so many different telescopes right now, the ones that we've even put out up into space to be able to see further into the deep darks of space. Um, they need to understand, like, how does some of that work, right? How do we get some of the pictures that we do? So again, just finding out what you have available to you. So this is one of those design thinking activities that I put in here. And again, this is a, it could be an enhancement. It depends on where your students are at. But really, this is for them to design what if we wanted to take another telescope and put it out into space? What are some things that they have to consider? They don't just sort of shoot it up there and say, here it is. There's some things that have to happen. And one of them too is that any spacecraft that goes out there has to be able to withstand the radiation that's coming towards them and all of those pieces. So this is really a design thinking question. It's really about what would they do to design a cover in order to sh make sure that their ship that's going to take their telescope out there isn't going to be impacted by radiation. So it gives them a chance to really think it through. They don't have to be all technical wizards and know everything about radiation. They have to know something, and that's a little bit of research on their part. But really, it's about the, the trial and error, and they're just going to be using a flashlight. So it gives them a really good sense of, of some things that have to be considered at a lower level. So again, this might be one you might want to consider. I'm not suggesting it is. It comes from a book that I've just got on the next page here, which is Mapping the Milky Way. It's a beautiful book. It's very appropriate for, for grade four. Um, it's an epic book. So I've got it hyperlinked at the bottom here for you, which means we don't have to purchase it if you can read it online with the students. Um, and it gives them that's exactly where I took that particular activity from. Comparing binoculars and telescopes different links that they can go to, different places that they might be able to find resources. Those are all sort of key elements to all of this. Again, just trying to provide you with sources that you can go to, as opposed to them necessarily being able to have to go somewhere in order to do that. Anything you want to add in on that one, Ted? No, other than that, as soon as you start comparing two, two ideas together, once again, you're deepening their understanding of it because they're looking looking deeper into those things. So. 
So as we move into our second understanding, now that we have some tools, we're also asking them to recognize that some of those stars, and some of your students may already know that, have distinct patterns to them. So the constellations, they might know some of them, that might be completely foreign to some of them. It depends on, again, what their interest levels and what exposure they've had to it. So do they know any of the constellations? Are they able to name any of them? Could they even just draw them out on a piece of paper if they had any knowledge of the backgrounds of those? So stars and constellations are recognizable on Earth and can be used for navigation and tracking the passage of time. And this is the one where I say you can't really kind of, that 1.3 where we talk about use, used over time and used for navigation, they kind of link together here because depending on how you unpack it, I can say, you know, I have this constellation and as it tracks across the sky, if, if I'm a navigator or I'm in, in times where we didn't have watches and we didn't have clocks, where they used the position of the stars to map out how time was traveling, whether it be year uh, during the year or whether it be during the night, like as in 24 hour period with the moon and all those different pieces. This is a way that we can juggle back and forth and it doesn't necessarily have to be just um, sort of a little box of how I, I look at the constellations. But really, when we look at um, day and night, I mean, there's a, a perfect example of how I can see tracking change over time. And we know that at different seasons, the daylight is different than it is in other seasons. So longer in some, shorter in others. And again, because not every student is going to have access to a telescope and going to a space science center, what you're gonna see now in the next couple of slides is a lot of different um, places that you could possibly use or sites that you could possibly use to allow students to go in and see how does it change when I'm going, I'm just gonna go into a couple of them, I won't go into every one of them, but the planisphere is a, is a great one. It, it kind of, it's a tool, all of these are just tools and you can enlarge these as you go, but you can see here that I've got the different months of the year out here and I have the different times of the day as well. So just without getting into all the technicalities, every one of these are hyperlinked so that you can go through with the students. But if I adjust it, I can see how my constellations are going to change at the different times of the year, right? And that they don't stay in the same place. So again, if the students have never, never even realized that, and I mean, obviously, if they've never had a chance to go and look at the star sky or if they're in a place where there's too much light, they are not going to see that. So this gives you that opportunity this is not the only one though. There's a number of them that are built in here that you'll be able to use with that same uh, location. So do you know the name of any stars or constellations? Who created the constellations? Why are they important? Why do we even care about constellation? So this is a great little video um, that just talks about that. Also talks about sometimes a little bit where the names of some of them came from. And you're also going to flip flop back and forth between indigenous cultures and different cultures who look up at the sky and have a name. They're not all called the Big Dipper for every culture, but they all see the same constellation. They all have a different story that goes with it. And that's also part of your 1.3, where you're talking about different cultures and the way they've seen them. So that's why I say you're gonna, you're gonna kind of flip back and forth here. I, I don't know how you would keep those as, as separate entities per se. Um, we want students to recognize that they could be found in different ways. So another star finder that you can use, and I've got a note up here, if they did research on finding stars, then you don't really want to go here. If they haven't done any research, they don't know how it got its name, they don't know anything about the different constellation, then click this on, and that would be a good source for you to go to. Again, not every one of these would be ones that you would use, um, nor should you. So what about... As we've been talking about, what about other cultures? How do they see and what do their stories over time, over years, hundreds of years, how did they look up at the sky? What were the stories behind it? But also what story, that story, what did it tell them about the season? What did it tell them about time passing? So um, we're going to watch just one very short one, but there's a whole bunch of them here. And I'll show you where there's a couple of other ones. But I did try to get sort of every different culture in here as much as we could. Oops.
So this story I'm going to relate to you concerns a group of stars in the sky that the Roman Greek mythology called Cepheus. Cepheus the king. And Cepheus the king is represented by five stars. And those five stars, they sort of look like a, uh, a house, outline of a house. There's a triangle on top and a rectangle on the bottom. So it forms a, like, a, like a, a silhouette of a house in the sky. So these five stars, the uh, Cree people call Mackinac the turtle. And uh, prior to the coming of the Europeans, Mackinac the turtle was uh, per basically our living calendar. Because when we saw that turtle, we were reminded of one complete cycle. We were told that if you look at a turtle shell, and this is evident of the uh, snapping turtle and the uh, painted turtle, the, the turtles I'm familiar with. I haven't been looking at the tortoises or any other kind of sea turtles or whatever, but these are the ones that I'm familiar with. So if you look at the shell of a snapping turtle or a painted turtle, on the inside of the turtle shell, there are 13 main sections. And we're told these 13 main sections are the 13 full moons of one complete cycle. And these full moons are separated by 28 days. So again, if you look at that turtle shell, on the outer edge of that turtle shell, there are 28 sections to separate the one, the one full moon from the next. So when you looked at that calendar, you were immediately reminded of, of uh, this, this turtle. And vice versa, the turtle reminded you of that calendar and about that, of that cycle. Each one of these full moons coincided with something happened in the environment, depending on wherever you were. For the Cree people, that very first moon in the wintertime, when it was high winter, was called Kichipisim. Kichipisim, and again, that, of course, that was around January time, times, various times in January. And then the following moon after that was Mikisupisim. Mikisupisim is the eagle moon, and that's when the eagles returned from down south. And the following moon after that was Niskapisim. And Niskapisim was the, was the goose moon. That's when the geese came back. So you got January, February, March, and then April, that was Arigis Pisum. Arigis Pisum is the frog moon. That's when the frogs started coming out of uh, sleep, their sleeping and started making all kinds of racket. So this, this again, these moons coincided with something happened in, in the environment in the local area. At various places in various environments, of course, those names would change depending on what was happening, where, where, where the people were. But this is one of the reasons why uh, this place, they refer to it as Turtle Island, because uh, a lot of the cultures on, on, on North America, Central America and South America looked at that turtle and they, they went by that full moon calendar, that lunar cycle. It was very sacred. And grandmothers were, were very sacred beings for our people. And that's why we call Grandmother Moon, Nuokum, because uh, very sacred, very honored. So that's Maganak the turtle. Next year. That's with that. So you got lots of different choices there. Wilfred Buck is well known for his star science and his ability to tie that, especially into curriculum. He has a lot of books out as well that would be really helpful in the classroom, but he also has lots of videos that are posted as well on, uh, on the internet. So you can definitely search them out. But again, now what he's talked about also ties into the Gregorian calendar, because that's one of the other pieces. How did we keep time? How did we get calendars from the time that we have and you you've heard him sort of outline how that fits into to play there this also if i'm looking at the other side working on the cpar documents for grade four time this fits into your time in math so you can tie these together and talk a little bit about the gregorian calendar and talk a little bit about those lunar cycles we're going to talk more depth uh, about lunar cycles in grade five but nonetheless, this is a good place to bring it up because the Gregorian calendar is part of the conversation that you have here in science. So you have a whole bunch of different choices here, and there, there are only six. I mean, there is probably 600 that you could choose from. So I, I'm trying to just sort of limit to give you an idea of what's there. I will show you another site where you have some, some additional ones that you can go to. Come on, let's go here. So again, you have, um, if I don't have access to a telescope, I can't take the kids out anywhere. You could go into any one of these here. These are the live um, locations. So again, you can go in, it will tell you what part of the night you're in. It You can tailor it to your location as well. 
So it gives you all of the different things that are happening at that particular time, tells you the sunrise in your location. It's um, a very interesting little site and you can just move yourself to where you are and it will give you all the updated information. There's another one that I'm going to show you which or that's on here that you'll be able to have access to which just shows you the night sky. You put in where you are and it will show you what you're going to see tonight. It'll show you what you're going to see tomorrow night. That's going to show you the next night. So it's it's in time, real time. So that gives you that opportunity to see. Okay, and then here's the other one. Um, the planner is exactly that. It tells you in time where you are located. Just click on the planner and it takes you to where you are. This will give you a bit of an insight on it as well as, as just what the students might watch for if they're not sure what to look for. If you have a parent or somebody who has a telescope, that's a great community event. Uh, we used to do that when I was principal in Hinton. We had a telescope night and it was amazing how many people came out, but it was fascinating because everybody just wanted to see what was happening in that sky above us. So it was nice to see. Uh, this is just another activity where, again, you can give the students an opportunity to create maybe their own little version of a telescope. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Um, they're saying just use this an old film camera, but maybe not just even a suit can, anything, anything that's a cylinder where they could put a piece of paper on the end of it and then they pick their own constellation. It doesn't have to be one of these, could be a different one. And they use uh, a hole, a, a, a nail or a pin or whatever to create the pattern and then hold it up to the light so that they would see what it looks like and then they can turn it and just get a sense of simple, but definitely very effective for students. So it just gives them another opportunity to be involved. This comes from this particular book here called From Hubble to Hubble, Astronomers Out in Space. So it just gives us, these are different, that book talks about the different kinds of telescopes that were developed over time right from the, the year of Galileo to where we are now and the ones that we're setting up in space. And then a little bit of research to find out what's the newest ones that are going out, right? So again, giving the students a chance to, to do that. Okay, many cultures connect observations of objects in space time to use their, to, to have their daily lives. So we've already seen kind of how we talk about the turtle's back. We talk about the lunar calendar. We looked at the the, the, the 13 moons is how they kept track of time. We see that different constellations appear at different parts of the sky at different times of the year. So again, that was an indicator of them. The North Star, when we talk about that, that's always the big one. So Polaris is a big one that we really want the students to be able to identify and be able to understand about the importance of that star. So again, those are the kinds of things that, that we would want to include in here. Here are some things on the Gregorian calendar, the lunar calendar, and how it, it kind of ties into where we are today. Um, what are the similarities? What are the differences? That's not the only calendar. Some students, when they do a little bit of research, will find that there's other kinds of calendars. How do those work, right? They all have some star alliance as well. So how, do, how does that particular calendar work? Not necessarily on 12 months of the year, not necessarily on 13 moons of the year either. So again, what are the possibilities? So again, here is an example of Turtle Island. Here are some other places that you might want to go to for, for the complete moon story. Um, that was just a very short one that Wilfred shared with us, but there's lots of ones. But then what is the relationship between the lunar calendar and what we just saw? Like, how does a lunar calendar work versus what we just heard Wilfred unpack, right? So that could be the the talk. And as Ted pointed out, do they know what a relationship is? Do they know what they're looking for when they're defining what a relationship is and they're making that happen between two different um, comparisons? Okay, people use both the solar and the lunar calendars at the same time. Why is that? Okay, again, I have to know something before I can make that kind of conversation happen. So Ted, do you want to take it away from here? Yeah, and so Chris just went through a whole lot of um, <clears throat> resources and, and possible activities that really get the students to deepen their understanding and of uh, the understandings themselves and of the individual concepts. And so at any old time along the way, we're always going to be giving students things to do 
and we're going to be doing our conversations, observations, and having to do their products. And those all become the formative assessments along the way. And so when we talk about transfer, that really is an assessment. We're giving students uh, something to do that hopefully that they'll, they've got the skills to allow to do it. And we're going to see how they do that. And then they're going to also demonstrate their understanding of something. And we're going to observe how they do that. So anytime we give them a learning activity, we're going to be observing those things. So they all become assessments and formative assessments in that way. So we can do a lot of those activities that Chris has and change them into assessments because they're applying something new to a different context with different calendars or with different videos and so on. Um, some of the other things that can happen is just asking those conceptual questions. For example, what is the relationship between objects and space and human activities? And can students provide, find, find examples? Again, they need to know what that sense of a relationship is. Or uh, give them a case study, perhaps maybe on tides. We haven't talked about tides, and we wouldn't want to get into the whys of tides, how they happen, but just to, enough to know that tides um, happen around the world and they are connected to the moon. And and then using that as a case study to answer the question, how does how do tides, does that support the idea that objects in space impact daily life? If so, how? And finally, of course, if we get to that next slide. So we ask you to do all, all those kinds of things. We could also uh, make concept maps. They often help show understanding of, of uh, different concepts and so on. So you cut up little pieces of paper and have students relate them into a concept map and put them together. They wouldn't be able to do it unless they had the knowledge and understand of each of those individual pieces in order to link them together. So concept maps are useful. There's uh, on that one slide that Chris, we paused on that had those with the blue links. If there are students that are not familiar with um, making concept maps, you'll go back to the service level and introduce concept maps and have students practice using concept maps before you start using it for assessment purposes. And finally, uh, we'll go back to that original ta performance task that I had at the front end. In other words, uh, backwards by design. Now that we know what our task was, would we could take a look at our assessment and say, do the students after doing all those activities, are they, they going to know enough and be able to do enough, have enough skills to be able to be successful in this assessment? They may need some help on something else, such as uh, ranking and so on, like and those kinds of things. But again, that's where the formative assessments come in place to let you know that, okay, my students are ready to do this particular activity, which would be one, again, because it would be a transfer activity, one they've never done before. They haven't ranked ordered. I mean, they've ranked ordered other things, but not the significance of, of how the planets or the objects in space um, impact our daily lives. So the end is is typically what we've always done, and that's just to give you some additional resources that augment what you've already seen at the front if you need more, um, depending on what you're looking or if you want to give them to the students. A couple of the resources as well that we will see, and these will be highlighted in the CPAR document as well. So you'll have more in there. We've got a number of different ones for, for space. Not all of them necessarily appropriate for grade four because they get a little bit too deep into uh, some of them. I did find one that was in French as well, for those of you who have the French immersion as well. Um, and then again, here are some of the ones that we've used in the past, some star stories, if you're looking for some other ones, but they're already hyperlinked for you. So if you need more, um, definitely those. And this is the Rothney Astro, uh, Astrophysical Observatory from Calgary. And it was kind of the one that, that I highlighted or linked in. The story of the moons were, were highlighted in the um, opening acknowledgement that we did. But I just want to take you there because I don't want you to think that that was the only thing that was there. They have a, a lot of materials that would be really relevant for the grade four curriculum here for sure. So here's your Indigenous Sky stories. This is just a bit of a write-up. But where you'll find most of that, and here are some stories that fit very well with grade four, again, and the telescopes. But here is where you can also find what are the stories related to the Milky Way? What are the ones from the Gemini? Here's the one for the moon that I already linked to the front. But these are all excellent ones. And not that every child would need to see every one of them, but maybe if they're gonna break out into small groups and do a little bit of research, that can also be part of the infographic kind of things that I put in. You know, we did a research on this and here's what we found. So there's a lot of material in here. They've done a beautiful job of putting this, this site together. So just keep that one in mind because it, it gives you lots of, of um, 
lots of information without having to actually be there. And I think that's what I was looking for is if we can't travel, then what do we do with, with the students? Okay, and then same thing here, you've got an assessment in grade four science. It just gives you um, some transfer and summative activities, things that we've looked at. I will go back and link those other ones. I didn't do that, but I will do that for sure and make sure that those are there. But this is this assessment in grade four, remember now, this is, um, I should back up on that one. This is a session that we have coming up. And I just wanna remind you, we mentioned it at the very, very beginning when we started, but this is an assessment that we had planned for once space was over for four, five, and six. We kind of felt that maybe the four, five, six teachers might like to come together and look at some assessment tools, building some assessment tools. And it's something to think about. Um, some school boards require the grade four, five, six teachers to have a final, some do not. And so depending on the people that attend, we would either create a year end kind of thing and depending on what the, the wish of the group is, how that would look, whether it's all performance based, whether it has a mix of multiple choice, whatever, or if we don't have people that are required to have a final, then do, how do we how do we want to maybe assess? Do we want to come up with different summatives for each organizing idea? It really will be up to the group. I mean, we are going to spend two full days. So this registration link right here, when you click that on, it's a free day. The only thing is you'd have to have two days of release time in order to be part of that. And at the end of those two days, um, we would be able to hopefully just hand you over, if not with a little bit of editing on our part, um, that resource so that you have it. So just so that you know what that's all about, um, you can just go in. These are the two dates that we have set aside for those. Um, and it really is more of a hands up, roll on, roll up your sleeves, join in, as opposed to, you know, we're not recording it, we're doing it. Like, so it's, it's if you want to be part of it, I guess that's what I wanna say is just, if you can join us, that'd be great. That would be wonderful. Anything, Ted, do you wanna add into that? Okay, so That's it, Chris. thanks. Are there any, I'll stop sharing, I'm gonna stop recording here, first of all. <laughs>